Our first two speakers are with the Standish Group, which has a long history since the 1990s of studying why software projects succeed or fail. Well, I want to thank you for having me at this conference. And um, what we're going to talk about today is a little different than what we normally talk about. We're actually starting a new chapter in the chaos research. And that involves uh, a bunch of universities, a number of universities. And that's why we're here today to announce the program that we're just beginning with partnership with the Antwerp University and Antwerp Management School. I want to talk about how we actually got started in this thing because I think it's pretty interesting. I, I began my career working for Digital Equipment Corporation in the early uh, 70s, actually late 60s. And I was working on a project um, to, uh, it's like, basically it was an Excel spreadsheet project. And um, I learned there about some of the techniques that we forgot about over the years. And, and I, I wrote a story called um, Agile is Old School because at Digital we did programs like we do Agile and Scrum back then. And as we formalized uh, the project uh, maintenance and project uh, management, we kind of lost some of that things, but we've kind of grabbed it back with some of the scrum ideas. And so we see that, and as I went forward in my career, I, I worked on applications and projects such as FAA, uh, flight information systems. And as I began that career and working on that, I kept seeing this pattern of project failure. And then, uh, we started uh, the Standish Group in uh, 1985. And we started it as a technology company. But we started it on the premise that if we collected lots of data and had different points of data, that we could do predictive analysis. In 1994, we did this little experiment. We called it the Chaos Report where we collected lots of data on projects and we did focus groups, we did interviews, we did um, uh, lots of surveys and profiles and we wrote the, uh, the chaos report in 1994. Now we thought that report would be, that's it. We would do that report, we'd write about it, it was published in Software Magazine or Application Trend Magazine and people kept coming to us and saying, well, are you going to do that report again? The GSA came to us and said, we're going to, we have $14 billion worth of projects. They're all in, in dire need. And I said, well, you know, well, let's look at your data. Let's talk to you about it. And so we started what was then called the KS University uh, program, which we would bring in industry uh, uh, notorious people from around the industry, around the world, to a, to a conference, and we would work on it and look at the issues surrounding why projects fail, why they succeeded, and we did about 500 of these groups over the last uh, 15 years. And so um, as, we, as we looked at that and tried to figure out what kind of things were successful, it was really important to have lots of data. And it's really important to be able to triangulate that data. So we, what we did was we had lots of different instruments. We had surveys. We had these work groups. We had eight different types of surveys. Some would ask about projects. Some would ask about the executive sponsor. Some would ask about the user involvement. So we had all these different instruments. And we had all this data. And, and we were going forward learning a lot. And we we're trying to figure out what kind of data could we get, what is a reasonable kind of data that would work. Some of the instruments were, didn't work at all. You know, we tried to get the data, but we couldn't get it because people just didn't know. And so that was the extension of, of the, the next phase, which started about 10 years ago, where we moved into two instruments. The two instruments are we're going to do a profile of the capability of the organization. So what we do is we do a work group, and we have about 50 questions and, and an interview. And uh, it takes about an hour or so to do this. And we profile the organization on their capability. The second instrument we do, 
we, we have a profile of projects and in, in sessions uh, later today, we're gonna show you the, what's in that profile. But it's about, you know, what's the size of the project? What's the methodology? What's, how long did it take? What was the cost? How many people involved? What was the confidence? Of the business? What was the outcome? Did they get value from it? Were the customers satisfied? And one thing we learned early on is that when we look at this data, it's not about true metrics because we did this focus group one time. We had, actually it was a series of focus groups. And in one of the focus groups, we asked them, you know, tell us about the last project you did. And so we went, we, but we had the CFO, we had the pro project manager, and we had the CIO. And we asked them to write down what they thought the project was successful, was it challenged, or was it failed, and we gave them the definition, our common definition. So we had them write down so they couldn't see each other's answers. And I can remember one group we did where the CFO said the project failed, the CIO said it was challenged, and the project manager said it was successful. And I said, okay, three different answers for the same question. Then I asked, went around and went around again, and I said, let's, let's talk about it. So we talked about it for about 10 minutes, and other people got in, because it was 12 people in the session. And I said, now what do you think? And the project manager says, well, since the people aren't using it, I guess it's a failed project. And the, C and the, the, the CFO said, well, but the project was completed, and everybody sort of did the job, you know, and we got it, uh, but, you know, it just people just didn't like it. I think it's a successful project. And then the CFO just shook his head and says, I just don't know. So for the one question, whether the project is successful, failed, or challenged, we had six different answers. Six different answers of the same question. So then I realized that if, it's, if people are going to give you their opinion, it should be our opinion. And so that's when we started really looking at case-based reasoning where we could have people input the cases, but then we would adjudicate the cases based upon what we thought it was. So the KS database is a collection of projects with lots of data that's been looked at in several instances and put a, a, a trained adjudicator can tell whether people are lying, telling the truth, or whether they think it's right. And, and this happens all the time. And so we have to, as, a, as an organization, for give us correct research, we have to make sure that the data is correct. And we throw out about 50% of projects because the data isn't uh, good enough. But what does all this mean? Well, the things we've really, one of the key things after 22 years of looking at this, I found that, that if we really want to be successful in projects, we call it the winning hand. And so the secrets of project, software project success is number one, it has to be small. So it has to be a small project. Six people, six months, little project succeeds very well. Large projects don't succeed very well. 81% of the winning hand of projects is successful. So number one, it's small. Number two, use an agile process. It works. People, self-directing teams work. Number three, you have to have a good sponsor. And I think for when I look at when I look at successful projects, I see a highly skilled executive sponsor. Someone that can inspire the team, that works hard, and can daydream. That has a lot of imagination. This is a uh, real honor to be here, standing next to Jim Johnson. Uh, he started in the 1990s with his uh, Standish Chaos database. And now it holds more than 100,000 of case studies. And as a scientist, this is a real treasure. Uh, more than 100,000 case studies of IT projects. However, the results of those uh, case studies are that most projects do not succeed. And if they do, they don't create value. And as a 
professor at the university, and it's not a nice idea to teach your students that most of the time they will not be successful in their careers. So it would be a good idea, I think, to learn from this database, to learn from the methodology from the Standish Group. So more than about 10 years ago, we met with the Standish Group and we decided how can we collaborate? How can we collaborate as a university with this still propriety database? Because it was only accessible by the people of the Standish Group themselves. So this year, in March, Jim gave the presentation at the university in Antwerp and we decided to change the game to make the university a part of the Standish Group. And therefore, the dean of the university signed a contract with Standish that we were the first university to be allowed to use this data collection, but furthermore, to enrich it, to use our professors, our PhD students, and our master students to use the database for our assignments. By the way, this is my department, beautiful Antwerp, an old, old city. And what we try to do then is to provide universities with a kind of collaboration um, uh, system called CAS, the Chaos University System. So where we're hoping for in this coming uh, days is that we will be here at the conference with our own info desk. The desk will be uh, that, uh, that available for answering questions, but also if you're interested to sign up for the Chaos University System. So perhaps we can collaborate in the coming years together on this topic of how to make IT more valuable for society as a whole. So that is the, the, the picture behind me. So we're looking for cases. This suitcase is an example of cases because it also gives uh, not only the possibility for the universities, but also for business and government alike. When we saw the first video clip, uh, it was taken from the hearings from the Dutch parliament it was estimated that the annual loss of um, uh, investments in IT for government only would be between about 1 billion till 5 billion euros. So that is a large amount of money you could spend a much better way. We use the design science research approach. So you could say that the standish artifact is the methodology, the data collection, and also the database, which is in the inner circle of the design cycle. The knowledge base is being formed by the universities to be sure that the data is valid. And if you can uh, remember, Jim said it's very hard to do that. And on the left side, we have the environment, which means we have to do the relevant cycle. You have to be relevant for your industry, relevant for your government, and you can do that by doing field testing. And that way, we are organizing the methodology behind the Standish Group. So thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you this coming days in the, the conference.